Hi, I'm John Ingold. I'm the narrative director of Inkle, and I'm here to talk today about Pendragon. So Inkle is an independent game studio. We've been going about 10 years. We've made a few games you might have heard of. We made one called 80 Days, which is about going around the world. We made a series of four games called Steve Jackson's Sorcery, which is a kind of Dungeons and Dragons fighting fantasy style choose your own adventure thing. And last year we made a 3D archaeological adventure game called Heaven's Vault, which has an entire hieroglyphic language in it to decipher. Now these games are all pretty different. They're quite different in their style and their tone and the way that they work and the sort of stories that they tell, but they have one thing in common, which we think of as like the Inkle thing, uh, which is they are all games that make stories happen. So we don't really think about them as narrative games or as even really a story game because that comes with a lot of assumptions about what the story is like and how it's told. Uh, what we think of it instead is it's a game where the story gives the player some actions they might want to do and the actions that the player does cause more story to happen. So you have this kind of constant loop and ideally everything the player is doing is part of the story and everything that's in the story is something that the player is doing. That's kind of the goal. That's what we try to do. So anyway, I want to talk to you today about how we designed, how we ended up designing our latest game, which is a bit different again, uh, which is called Pendragon. And it's out on the 22nd of September, so that's like next week if this video goes out when I think this video is going to go out, but I don't actually know when this video is going to go out. So anyway, it's going to be out on September the 22nd, so that's when it's out. Um, and it's going to be great and all of that. And it's not a choose your own adventure and it's not a adventure game at all. It's a tactics game. So how did we end up making a tactics game? Well, it was sort of by accident, really. We were working on Heaven's Vault and at the same time, uh, for fun, our, one of our designers, one of our designer developers, Tom Kale, uh, was messing around with a tactics prototype. And it was originally designed to be a two player minimal strategy game, pretty much a board game. And I guess the idea was how few rules can you have and make a game that's still actually interesting. And he started with this idea of turn based Splatoon. So you have pieces on two teams and each team paints squares as they move around and then they can run faster on squares that they painted. And that's kind of it. Otherwise, it works like chess pieces capture other pieces. We played this game for ages. We played it over the lunch breaks when we were taking a break from Heaven's Vault and we messed around with the rules. There are so many subtleties to the rules of even a simple game. Something like uh, chess has obviously got quite complicated pieces, but a game like Drafts or Checkers in America um, has only a few rules, but they're exactly the right ones. Because if you don't have the right ones in a symmetric board game, then either the first person who the person who starts always wins or the person who starts always loses or you end up in this permanent stalemate in which no one can do anything in the game just goes on and on and on until everybody dies of boredom and we definitely had each of those during the course of developing this prototype and tweaking the rules but we you know, added a rule here took one away there added one there took another one away sometimes they were too complicated and we couldn't explain them to anyone sometimes they were too simple and they didn't really do anything but after a while the rules settled down and we ended up with this game that generated interesting situations and wasn't completely pointless it was always a little bit different but we didn't have a narrative and we're the company that makes story game game stories whatever so we couldn't ship it. So we kind of put it in a box and forgot about it. And we thought, well, never mind. Because you, we not only didn't have a narrative, we couldn't see how to give it a narrative. Normally, the narrative and the gameplay kind of build at the same time as each other when we're designing something. But here we had the game fully formed and it was quite good. But there didn't seem to be a way to staple gun a narrative onto it. Because it's not like you can just do that. I mean, imagine a game that you know, like... Uh, Chinese checkers, you've got the pieces jumping around the board and what do they do? Like, what's the storytelling here? Well, maybe they could talk to each other, but what have they got to talk about? The red ones are going that way and the green ones are going that way and they're both going to charge into each other and perhaps some pieces get sacrificed and thrown away, but they all look identical and you don't really care about any of them anyway and you can't really remember which is which. So you'd end up with a game which looks a bit like this and it would be sort of pointless. Um... And it wouldn't really be very interesting. Uh, so we thought, well, OK, we can't really do that. But well, what else do people do? Well, sometimes people do the 
story, gameplay, story, gameplay, story, gameplay thing, right? We So, you know, we have a bit of an introductory text and that's very exciting and it tells the story. And then you have a little mini game where you play Ninth Men's Morris for a bit. And then you have a bit more story to carry on the story. But we thought, no, that's kind of rubbish as well, actually, because let's face it, the gameplay in the middle doesn't really have anything to do with the story on either side and you're never going to convince anyone that it does. Uh, so we thought, no, we, we can't do that. That doesn't work either. And it was kind of frustrating because we started to feel that maybe there's something about this kind of counter-based board game that is particularly bad at, at gluing to narrative, at being connected to narrative, because it's just so abstract. I mean, you know, even when you play a game of Top Trumps, you can kind of imagine the story that's going on. You know, here are these two dogs and they're going to face off against each other. And they one of them's got cuteness of 15, but the other one is even cuter at 28. And you can imagine how that's going to go down. And you get a little bit of a storytelling hook. There may be something you can work with, um, but that just really doesn't happen in uh, chess. It really doesn't happen in drafts, or at least we couldn't see how to make it happen. So we gave up. Uh, we chelled it. We kind of forgot about it. And uh, it might have stayed that way, except then a bit later, we had an idea. And quite often when you're doing game development or game design, um, you have an idea that comes from somewhere else completely uh, and you just see that it connects. And that's kind of what happened here. So, so where did that idea come from? Well, right, I'm basically 40. I'm nearly 40. I'm not actually 40, but I'm, I'm going to be 40 pretty soon, which is ridiculously old, right? And it means that when I was growing up in the 90s, uh, the world was a completely different place. I mean, yeah, yeah, there weren't any iPhones, all that sort of stuff. But more importantly, the world was culturally a completely different place. Uh, for some reason, we thought the X-Files was incredibly cool. Uh, and, you know, everyone would tune in every week to, to listen to the theme tune and maybe follow the plot slightly. Uh, for some reason, Star Trek was still a family friendly show, which had absolutely no body horror in it whatsoever. And uh, we could just watch it all together as, as 10 year olds. For some reason, we thought the Spice Girls were incredibly progressive. I don't really understand why, but, but we did. They sold that to us somehow. And there was one other thing in the 90s, which has thankfully almost entirely, as far as I'm aware, been forgotten about by uh, the children of today. Well done, everyone. Uh, which was which was this. Okay, well, that's quite enough of that. So it's called Austin Powers, and it was a, a series of films about a 1960s groovy spy who wakes up in the modern world, and it was a sort of affectionate and fairly accurate spoof of the 1960s James Bond movies, which is sort of completely pointless because the 1960s James Bond movies were ridiculous anyway. I mean, the bad guy was a one-eyed bald German who lived in a volcano with an albino cat. But never mind. Um, there they were. And they were quite funny and they were quite fun. And we all loved them. And we thought they were brilliant. We thought they were amazing. And there was one joke in Austin Powers, which everybody remembered. And I think everybody still does remember, which was the dead henchman joke. So the idea is... Um, Powers is breaking into the underground enemy base and uh, along the way he shoves a henchman backwards and he falls into a pit of sharks and is, is torn to death. And then we cut to a group of guys in a bar and they're, they're getting ready to celebrate the birthday of their friend and they're, they're drinking beers and they're talking about how great their friend is. I think he's called John or Tim or something like that. And they're saying, oh, what a wonderful guy he is and how he's just bought a house and he's just moved in with his wife. Um, and then they get a phone call. And they answer the phone call and they look pretty shocked. And the guy who answers the phone puts the phone down and says uh, that that was that was John's work or Tim's work. I can't remember. And he, that he'd just been pushed into a pit full of sharks and, and torn to shreds. And this birthday party turns into a wake and they all start remembering what a great guy uh, John or possibly Tim was. And then we cut back to Powers and he makes a joke and he carries on and charges forward into the base. And it's a good joke because we're not expecting it, right? Because in these films... Bond or Powers guns down a hundred henchmen and we just don't pay any attention to them at all. 
Um, but it doesn't make us feel anything. It doesn't make us feel an emotional attachment to anyone. Um, we, we don't worry about the henchman lying in the pool of sharks or, or his, his wife um, because it's ridiculous, right? It's a ridiculous idea. The whole thing is ridiculous. The whole setup is. Um, but curiously enough, it's a sticky sort of idea. I mean, it's the same thing that The Last of Us Part 2 does, right? When it has this habit of naming all the people that you kill um, and then having them shout out, oh no, she's killed Eric, um, or whatever. And that's a nice idea. And it's supposed to make us feel for our victims, but it, and, and turn them from kind of computer game bad guys into real people, but it doesn't work. It's a great game, but that doesn't work. Um, because it's just lip service, right? It's not even up to the action movie trope where, you know, one of the disposable heroes says, oh, I'm going to go home and I'm going to start up my airline delivery service. Um, and then I'm going to propose to my wife, she's pregnant, uh, and then immediately gets eaten by a dinosaur or something. It doesn't even have that level of development behind it. It really is just, there's a person, there's a name, and then they're dead. Um, so anyway, we were thinking about strategic abstract narrative board games and how to turn the pieces on the board from these cannon fodder representations, like tokens of people, into people you might care about. Um, and how bad games are in general at making us believe that the people in the game are people at all, as opposed to tools to manipulate, targets to strike down. And that got us asking a question. And, you know, Quite often good design does start with a question and the question was this just what would you need to do to make the pieces in a game of chess into people like we could just call the queen queen sharon couldn't we and we could have the king who's called king brian or something shout no sharon when she puts herself into a sacrifice move and that would be a start maybe that would be quite fun i don't think i've ever even seen that done um but it wouldn't really be enough right it would be pretty random so what else do we need to do? Well, in general, when you're writing a story, if your ending isn't working, if it isn't landing, if the big betrayal at the end, it just isn't as exciting as it was supposed to be because everyone thought that guy looked shifty anyway, or it isn't as emotional when the sidekick dies because no one could really remember what his name was, then usually it's not because your ending is bad, it's because your setup is bad, right? It's because you haven't put enough work into developing whatever it is you wanted the audience to buy into before you take it away from them or you turn it on its head. Um, so for Pendragon, for this game of chess with King Brian and Queen Sharon, we thought, how can we build up our characters? Not just how can we kill them off? Not how do we just shout out like, oh no, she killed Eric when she kills Eric. But how can we build up this character of Eric before you kill him? Even just a little bit. How can we do that? How can we find opportunities to do that? Um, how can we make sure that when Sharon and Brian have this terrible, heartbreaking falling out that you can see on the screen right now, um, it means something to us because we've seen them be nice to each other or, or be happy together or share a quiet moment or, or a joke or uh, maybe, you know, looked out for each other. Perhaps one of them has saved another from another piece earlier in the match and, and they, they remember this. So we figured that it's all about follow through. It's all about making the characters on the board react to one another, not just reacting to one another dying, but reacting to all the little things that people do, all the just stepping forward, advancing, being behind someone, backing someone up, being together on the board, all these little positional things that your chess pieces might do as they play through the game before you get to the big stuff. What's interesting about that is as soon as we realised that, we realised this was the same as the way we've designed all of our other games. Back when we were making Sorcery, which is a sort of choose your own adventure game, one of our ideas was instead of giving the player big choices all the time, you know, do you kill the dog or do you eat the dog or do you push the dog down the well or whatever you do to this poor dog. Um, it's all about little choices. Do you step forward? What do you look at? What do you say? Okay, you said something. What do you say next? How do you develop a scene piece by piece by piece so that when it goes wrong, the player thinks, oh, I really did walk into that. They don't just think there was one choice and an outcome. I hate that in games when you make a choice, especially a story choice, and then it gives you a result. I like it when things stack up piece by piece, turn by turn, like you're betting in a game of blackjack or developing your pieces on a chessboard. 
you don't just move one piece and win or lose that right that's not how chess works it's a slow build up over time so how do we do that narratively well that's what pendragon tries to do every piece on the board is a person and as they move around the board they talk to each other so here's a level in which our knight who is this guy on the left uh, is encountering Sake. Well, Sake is currently a bad piece, an enemy piece. He's in blue. You don't like the blues, we like the reds. Um, but they talk to each other as they move across the board. And as the level progresses and they move closer together, that conversation continues as they try to size each other up and explore each other. At the end of this level, you probably end up recruiting Kay to your side. So actually, that's not a fight at all but you could attack him and he could turn out to be a bad guy and you will of course meet people who do turn out to be bad guys you don't quite know how the scene is going to go um what else do they do well if there's two heroes on the board they might reminisce with each other they might argue they might look out for each other um so we've implemented this we've made sure that all of our characters have ideas, things that they know, things that they're interested in, and things they want to talk about. We've given all of our characters personality traits, and we've also recorded all the things that happen between the characters. So if a character saves another character's life, or if a character sacrifices themselves to give another character an advantage, or sacrifices themselves and asks to be avenged in their final moments, all of this stuff is recorded and built into the dynamics of what happens between the pieces in the levels that follow, in the level and the level and the level and the level that comes afterwards. And that was kind of cool. And we quite enjoyed it. And it meant that when finally at the end of our, our story, at the end of our game, um, King Arthur uh, sees Queen Guinevere die. Because somewhere along the line, we decided that Pendragon was going to be an Arthurian story, not just about Brian and Sharon, the king and queen of the chessboard. But that's kind of not got anything to do with the design, really. Um, we found that that worked quite well. We quite liked it. And it was pretty fun. But what really made it come to life, what really made these little bits of dialogue and these little bits of scene coming out of the game work for us, what's really got me excited about it is um, when we brought in human enemies that talk as well. Because that, I think, was when we found out what the game really was. Uh, because it's not actually Austin Powers. We're not actually making Austin Powers the game, which is great. Uh, in a way, what we're really making is it's kind of more like Pirates of the Caribbean or The Princess Bride or something like that. It's a game about swashbuckling uh, fighters trading insults on the board as they dance around each other waiting to land the killer blow. And that was in the end how we designed the final level of the game where you meet the evil Sir Mordred who's the big bad guy and it's a one-on-one -on -one duel and the two of you just bicker each other to death. There's some gameplay there as well. But it's about trash talking. It's about throwing insults. It's about trying to belittle the other person. It's about trying to make Sir Mordred angry before he makes you make a mistake. It's circling around each other. And that, to me, sounds narrative, but it also sounds a little bit like a narrative-based tactics board game, um, assuming that the rules match up, which is kind of cool. We found a way to characterize those little pieces on the board. The only problem that we've had, which perhaps we should have seen coming, is that we find in playtesting, people are not very good at sacrificing pieces. So you know how in chess you quite often throw your pieces into a bloodbath. He takes me and she takes you and I take him and she takes you and he takes... That we really had to struggle to get people to actually be willing to just throw their knights uh, into the jaws of death. Which is a shame because the game is a lot more fun when everybody's upset about each other dying than when everyone's circling around being cautious, not willing to engage. Still, we're working on that. We think we've got the UI dialed at this point, and by the time the game comes out next week, or whenever it is that it comes out in your timeline rather than my timeline, uh, then, it, yeah, it's, I think it works. But you'll have to check it out to see what you think. But it's, I think it's quite a new idea, and we didn't have a lot of things to go on to figure out how best to do it. Um, but that is Pendragon, the game where the pawns on the chessboard talk to each other, fall in love, argue, and occasionally murder each other. And it is not as silly as Austin Powers, and it's definitely not as silly as the Spice Girls or Fox Mulder's hair. Um, but hopefully, when a piece is killed because you've made a mistake, or um, because of a sacrifice that you did deliberately, you might feel just a little bit guilty. Um, so I'm going to leave you with the trailer for Pendragon so you can kind of see the system in action and the kind of things that come out. But otherwise... Thank you for listening.
Thanks very much for listening. Have a great EGX.